Muslim picks up a Shadow Shaman. Bone Seven will be taking that Doom off lane. And it looks like they've all picked, so we're ready to go. We're going to send it over to our commentators. We'll be joining Toby and Cinderin as they take us into the match. Thank you very much. Uh, we are live here, Cloud9 versus Navi. Uh, it is day two of the tournament, Cinderin, and this is when the stuff gets real. This is when teams get eliminated from the international. Uh, I think there's a lot of teams that just transform when they're playing under pressure. I think Navi is one of the best examples of a team that has a history of sometimes underperforming, dropping into a lower bracket, and then when it matters the most, they pull out their best performance. Uh, perhaps C9 is a little bit the opposite, like Bruno was talking about in the panel. Uh, when they are under pressure, sometimes they crumble. They like to say that themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe it's mainly Envy talking about that. Uh, but they know how much is on the line and how important it is. So hopefully for them, this is going to be one of the series where it matters a lot and where they pull off a great performance. Yeah, I'm hoping for both teams to play a great performance. The, really, I know a lot of people are here, right in, the, right in the key arena, are be sitting there with the same thoughts as me. I love both teams. I love both teams. To see one of these teams go down is already going to be really, really sad. But either way, I'm just hoping for a really great best of three series that just displays why these two teams have so many big fans all around the world. But we're going to get ourselves into the game now as the Foghorn gets to sound the creep wave. We're going to spawn out. So as far as the lanes go, the running begins. through, uh, you know, it's rather appropriate, I'll do Navi. Uh, <laughs> we'll have Dendi, not actually playing the mid-solo in this game. He's actually up on the top lane, taking the role as the Mirana. That puts the supporting Koro onto Alina. I'm happy to see him back there too. It's an old signature hero of Koro's. Hasn't been played as much of late, but he's going to be in, in that role today. Havorst in the number four position, a mid-solo role, playing the face of Void. Puppy will be the rotating Enchantress, and that leaves Afanik actually playing the offlane Elder Titan and not Koro support, as was mentioned before. And on Cloud9 side, no surprise here, it will be Bone 7 in the offlane on the Doom, Pilot Eye on the Earthshaker. In the mid lane, we've got Sing Sing playing on his signature Ember Spirit. And then in the safe lane, it will be AOI 2000 as well as Eternal Envy playing Shadow Shaman and Morphling, respectively. This is going to be an interesting fun lane in the mid, man. You've got Havost versus, uh, versus Sing Sing, the Ember versus the Faceless Void. And Ember Spirit, we know what Sing Sing loves to build on this, on this hero. He likes having the high level up in the Flame Guard as well as the Searing Chains, which is going to be difficult for Havost when he comes in really close up against Sing Sing. He can't always just rely on, like, backtrack to keep him out. Um, while Bone 7 cops a little bit of harassment up on that top lane. Uh, but it's that middle lane at which everything turns around when this happens from Puppy. He just brings in the Satter, he's slowly chipping away at Sing Sing, and Sing Sing can't afford to have this happen to him. He went to PMS to start with, which means he needs to have some extra help to make sure he can get to that bottle and then start controlling Havost. Yeah, and Havost managed to uh, oh, 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 get a good time lock there as well. That's not the random generator that Sing Sing wants to be facing up against. He actually got, like, only got the first point up in time lock. It's like Havost wants to try and man fight up against an Ember Spirit. And in addition to that, of course, with all, with all the help coming in from Puppy already and with Havost starting out nicely on his own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it is, it is level 2 now, so 15% chance per attack. And yeah. of course, we should mention this is a pseudo random ability, so if you get oh, really lucky, trouble, bottom really lane, all lane. <laughs> This could be first blood right now. The last attack from Envy will get it. Owie as well as Envy is a very, very safe lane with the Shadow Shaman as well as the Morphling. And they're able to capitalize and bring down that off lane of Funic. This is one weakness that Navi's draft has already. I think a hero like Elder Titan is is one of the great offlaners on paper, but he's just so much worse on Dire than on Radiant. And you just see C9 taking great advantage of it right now. He can't really pull the creep wave. He's struggling to even reach level two. I mean, he's currently got 41 experience points and died for that. Sometimes it's okay to die in the offlane if you get like a level and a half or something, or two levels out of it. You'll see some offlaners just deliberately trading their life away for a better position in the lane. But Funic isn't seeming to get anything down here, whereas Bone 7 being Radiant, he's already level three. Yeah. Man. Look at mid lane CS. I'm actually really surprised. I know Havos has obviously been having a great time with a couple of nice time locks over on De uh, over on uh, Sing Sing, but you've got this position where he's 18-3 up against a 10 for one. The Void is in four and a half levels. Puppy's going to be coming out of the jungle at some point because you know it's an enchantress. He's got to be smoke ganking somewhere across the map. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're going to see someone going down because that Crow is going to lock in that Ember Spirit and he'll go absolutely nowhere. Um, also, very, very smart play coming out there from the Earthshaker. Part I rotated over and used the Fissure to stun out the Wild Wing. So he didn't have to put himself in any kind of peril and make sure that tornado disappears from the lane. So Sing Sing actually has some kind of way of fighting here in the mid without battling the elements as well. 
But yeah, you're right. This is some uh, some smart laning coming out from Navi in the beginning, putting the void in the mid lane, which I guess Cloud9 weren't expecting, and neither were we. Especially with Havost on it, he usually plays the safe lane position. But in this particular game, Mirana's one weakness in the lane is that she has really weak base damage. And if you're playing yeah. up against an Ember Spirit who levels up Flame Guard, you also can't kill him with your magic damage. So. The call from Navi here is, all right, our Void is going to be doing great in the mid lane since he has good base damage and can just stand and sustain and will help him out a little bit with the Enchantress. And then in the safe lane, they can also put more pressure on the Doom, simply because Mirana Lina is a flat out better lane to put pressure than a, a Void Lina would have been. We have Moomoo coming out for, actually no, we are. We have Puppy coming down to check for the four minute rune. I thought that Centaur was coming with him, but it was just aggro. Why is this top lane not really, like, Dendi is only 16 for 9 up on this top lane. There's more CS coming out from Envy on your safe lane as well as a boss in the middle lane. What's going wrong on this top lane for Navi? I haven't been following it that closely, but judging from Bone7's farm, I would imagine he has been uh, disrupting the creep wave a little bit with some pulls. Maybe Navi have tried to focus a lot more on harassing the Doom rather than farming, and then oftentimes he will be trading some CS as the uh, Murano in doing that. And the third thing is, Bone7 ate a Chain Lightning creep. And he might have simply just messed up the lane equilibrium a lot with that. It's actually a really intelligent play picking up that ability here, I think. When you're in the off lane, it's, it's a natural and easy way for you to, to push the lane if you want to, or to secure some ECC ass. You see it right there. It's actually working out really nice. I think it's the first time I've even seen that. Unfortunately, for the first time I watch it, I'm seeing... Uh, okay, now we've got the two CS. He used it and then allowed both Denny as well as uh, Korra to get one to nine apiece. But either way, five minutes into it, that creep wave is so close to bone seven. We get the light strike already connect, but Deddy is in no position to throw out Nara. And also with the Earth Shaker from Highline Die hovering nearby, we go back to a very old school combination. We just have the Earth Shaker babysitting now. Light strike away from Kuro gonna miss. This could be real trouble for Navi. Puppy's coming in from the side. The helmet, Tomato Smash are looking for a kill. Dandy too low, leaves himself away on low life. And now the Troll Trapper. Puppy's gonna try and do this solo up against bone seven, trying to get the helm there in front of the body block. There goes your clap, slowing him down, but he does not have enough damage to kill off the Doombringer, but he does keep Koro and Dendi alive on that top lane. Yeah, good play from Puppy to come in there and, and save his lane, basically. Both Koro and, and Dendi missing crucial spells here, so maybe a little bit of a warm-up situation Dying for them. We don't, usually don't attack. see Koro missing spells like this, and the arrow from Dendi was a little bit off the mark as well, but they might be getting back in shape. At least the good thing for Navi is the mid lane. Uh, you were talking about how Havost was winning the lane by about 10 CS. You know what? He's winning it by 22 now. And it's it's just the equilibrium that he's been managing to keep on his side of the river. And it's very hard for Sing Sing to go up there and contest the farm because Havost will just always go into just fight him mm -hmm. face to face, basically. Man, this is gonna this is gonna get a little bit more difficult though. As I'm watching Havost, he's actually not going in for what I thought was going to be like early attack or something along these lines. He's actually going straight in for just a straight hand of Midas. So with this farm, it's almost like he needs to switch himself out of the lane and give some extra space. I don't know if you want to just switch Dendi in towards that middle lane to go up against an Ember, because that could just be suicide. But I think they're looking for a Chrono. Yeah, there it is. Chrono into Arrow. Where is the Arrow? Here it comes in now, and it will connect over on Sing Sing. The Flame Guards protecting him a hell of a lot with the extra Starfall. Look at Sing Sing! Tanks up the entire thing, Spear is back behind the tower. And now you see the power of that level 3 Flame Guard. Yeah, it was unfortunate timing here for Na'Vi that they went in with the Chrono during the Flame Guard, else that is an easy kill. But blocking all the damage from the arrow as well as the Star Storm here from Dendi, I wouldn't call it a wasted rotation because sure they did put a lot of pressure, but at the end of the day, they use a Chrono, they commit about a minute time on their safe lane Mirana. Giving Koro some space top is going to be great since he's close to level 6, but... He's actually a higher level than Dendi. He's higher level than Dendi now, and I don't, I don't think it's, a, it's that good of a start for Na'Vi if that Mirana doesn't get good farm. It's, it's great for Void to be getting a lot like this, it's definitely not a problem. Middle lane, have lost. he yeah. just jumps it's himself over jump the top of the Fissure. See, I'm kind of okay with this top lane. Denny doesn't have a high amount of levels. Okay, that's never really a great thing. But at the same time, getting that level 6 over on the Lena, when you open up that level of burst damage, kills like what happened on the top lane won't be able to happen again for C9, and Na'Vi will be able to get the pick off. But at the same time, it's at the, it's at the trade off of a level 6 Doom at 7 minutes, so. True. It's not the Dyer's best trade in the world, and this is, is as Gods was pointing out, it's probably the key hero for Cloud9 in this matchup to be able to deal with, in particular, the Void, so they have some lockdown or reliable lockdown and teamfight initiation out of him. Um, and his counterpart on Navi's side in the offlane, going to come back to that right now, Funic is level 3, 8 minutes in. And this is the Elder Titan issue in the Dire offlane. He doesn't really have a plan B. If you're tied, you can maybe stack the Ancients and you can start farming them with Anchor Smash when you're level 3 or level 4, or you can just flat out go into the jungle, but Elder Titan really doesn't... He doesn't have abilities that are that good for it, Dyer's so if he gets countered out hard, he, 
He really it's, does. It's gang time. Funnix being attacked, but what is happening right now is Navi actually picked up a triple center. One of them is timed out in the meantime, but the smoke movement's now going to break out. We're almost in time. in trouble. Still. He didn't move out. The spirit will come in. The searing taser from Sing Sing kills off Goro. And then the follow up stop. Funnix will finally drop him down. And Sing Sing, well, he's chasing Dying after Funnix. How much damage he's got? Invis through. He's actually hunting him Invis into the searing chain. The ball pulling waveform over. Boy Chrono back over towards Aoi, trying to get some kind of collateral. Fun. And they will be able to pick it up. Up. It's a two for two while Danny on the top lane attack. running and he's doomed up and killed off by Bone 7. C9. It was technically one. An even trade in the bottom lane. Now the TP is double top attack top coming towards the top lane. Top. Bone 7 thought he could walk past the tower. Oh, what a great duel. He actually just walked straight through. Really, really nice eating the tree and cutting the path there. I think he might have even survived anyway, but still a, a great display of, uh, of awareness here coming out from, uh, from Bone 7. And this is the problem with the top lane. When Doom is level 6 and you have a Mirana, it actually, even if Mirana is level 8, if you get Doomed, Doom can just run you down and kill you. You don't really have any sort of response. Very low hit point hero. Sure, Dendi has somewhat decent armor, but it's not going to be enough, so. Yeah. He's now going to rotate into the mid lane. He's currently level 5. I'm not sure about this, man. Oh, also this is going to be another hard lane. Dendi's pretty much struggling no matter where he goes. There's no easy lane anymore. It kind of feels like it's a suicide. Funny having real trouble up on top lane, too. He got hit a little bit, and uh, Bone 7 just keeps going with that, with that lightning. But Koro, again, missing on the Light Strike Array. If he goes able to nail that one, maybe with Laguna Blade, they'd have enough damage to get through the Doom. Could have got him down to half if they used that. Dyer's bottom tower. <laughs> he has 1250 health. There is... There's actually no solution to the Doom for Na'Vi right now, apart from landing a Chrono. I don't think they can kill him, okay, if they chain all their other spells on multiple heroes, but there's no duo from Na'Vi that can kill the Void. The Elder Titan and Lina can't, they need the Void there. Yep. Or a perfect arrow from Dendi could maybe be enough, but I'm not even sure that's going to be enough together with Koro's Burst. They need to get through 1200 health and a level 4 Scorched Earth. He's getting a lot, he already has the Buckler as well, working on that mechanism for his team. Life is getting a lot more difficult here for Na'Vi. And of course, like, dude, like, I saw him on the bottom lane before he was forced all the way back to base by Eternal Envy, just because Eternal Envy waveformed and attacked him a couple of times. And Envy is still free farming the bottom lane. It's a 77 for 20 CS, I mean 78 now for 20 CS, over on Eternal Envy. Like, that's a lot of farm to have over on a Morphling. He's about to pick up his ultimate orb down here as well. He's freely farming, you're gonna have a Lincoln Sphere before a 15 minute mark. This is really problematic for, uh, for Na'Vi, because they're not going to be able to control the Morphling. You're trying to talk about how much damage have they got to kill off the Doom Ringer. They've still got control problems between Sing Sing as well as Eternal Envy. It's, it's one issue Na'Vi will have to deal with later on, is that they need to kind of choose their target, unless if Cloud9 just serves them all in a platter and they, they get a great throw on multiple ones. They need to choose who they want to burst down. I don't think killing the Morphling is actually going to be as big of a problem as you might expect, simply because of the Elder Titan's Astral, Astral Spirit Natural Order combo. Uh, if he gets Chrono together with that and you hit a Laguna Blade, Morphling pl pretty much just disappears and has zero armor as well, so the physical damage. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Vision is set up, Searing Chase to follow up, Lion Strike Array again avoided there by Sing Sing. He's a little bit too short and pumpy. Well, he finds Pilot Eye over on the side. At the same time, Kuro is forced a long way back, Pilot Eye die. He is going to TP himself back out to safety. Even though he does have Sing Sing and Bone 7, they, they see the, re the uh, response from Na'Vi coming in. And of course, with a crept up Chrono, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna play with fire. They don't need to. They are so far ahead right now. Their gold is up to about 3,000. Their experience is stretching back up to about 1,500. It doesn't seem like much, but in a game when you're running cores like Morphling, Ember Spirit, and Doombringer, these guys are very, very difficult to kill off. And a guy who's been relatively quiet so far this game, AUI2000, is now close to level 6 on the Shadow Shaman. I imagine he's going to be a lot more loud after that. He'll be looking to push down the mid tower probably with his first set of Mass Serpent Wards when they come up here soon. I it's, like this uh, as well, the man who he's farming right next to, Mr. Point Booster running around uh, on the Ember Spirit. This is something which C9 really, really prefer. They rush Guardi over on the Ember Spirits a lot of times, especially when they feel ahead. I got a funny feeling we're seeing that again now. He can afford to not go for a heavy damage Radiant's build when he has a Doom and a Morphling, attack. and they know how well the Morphling farms. So, Den uh, sorry, Sing Sing is playing a little bit more of a control Ember Spirit, I want to call it. When you get the Scotty and you apply the slow on everyone with a sleight of fists, it gets very easy to chase down targets and just control the flow of the fight. So, once again, I feel like in this game for now, there's a lot of pressure on the guy who just jumped in, man. This is an easy kill on AY unless there's any sort of defense. There's not, but a turnaround! Looks for the Searing Chase, he's able to leave himself up, but now Sing Sing, he's in too deep, Laguna play from Goro. Allows Na'Vi to pick up two 
kills the Santa Blast coming out from Bone 7, but he can't see Denny, the Moonlight Shadow, protecting Dyer's Young Navi at the moment. And Bone 7 is forced to back, back to his side of the river. In the meantime, though, Eternal Navi has almost brought down the Tier 2 tower in the bottom lane, and the TPing support in, but Envy, he's just going to replicate back out again, back to his own jungle. Does he have anything on the Courier? No. But he, uh, again, yeah, he's a thousand short from the Lincolns. This is a very early Roshare from, uh, from yeah. Navi as well. Not, I don't, not really that early, actually, but... Yeah, More like they didn't set it up perfectly in, in terms of how many kills they, they got to, to secure it. They've got Chronosphere on cooldown. They're in a decent position to do it with, of course, with the, the level 3 on Untouchable on, on Puppies and Chantress, as well as most with the, with the Mask of Madness. But it's a kill that's going to take quite a bit of time. But as long as Cloud9 have no idea it's going on, it's probably going to, uh, to go Na'Vi's way for free. So, actually, really nice play by them to turn one kill on Sing Sing into a Roche here, which is, you know, I guess it could be expected, but... This wasn't an easy call to make. Yeah. And the counterplay could come. But it, it's it's going to be really quick. And at the end of the day, they are just too far away. They don't have an earth shaker there, so they can't control Your the action around the pit. The and with no Ember Spirit, spirit inside the, uh, the pit, attack. there's no way to really scout out and see what's going on. Because Sing Sing was using, of course, those to try and survive in the middle lane before. So it's now 5 to 4, 14 minutes in. We see the first Roshan take a fall. And the players just try and back themselves up, especially Na'Vi. You get a couple of kills, but you still need to make sure this turns into key items. So you've already got RK Boots over on the Lena. What do we got from Puppy? He's got Urn, he's got Treads, but he still needs to go into a couple more support items for his team. And a Vorst is great. He's got now an Aegis Immortal with his Mask of Madness, so he can be a little bit more over-aggressive, but he still needs to find a higher level of damage than just a Mask of Madness. And he will need some sort of defensive items, yeah. because playing against this kind of lineup, I think a BKB is absolutely mandatory. Both the Fissure is great against Void when he opens with the Chrono. It's, a, it's one of the easiest counterplays and one of the most reliable ones you can have against Void. There's a Shadow Shaman who, I guess we assume, will be going for a Blink Dagger as his next item. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Doom, where, yeah, okay, it still goes through BKB, but if you're BKB, maybe you can actually reset and come back in the fight, because the physical damage from Cloud9 isn't there just yet. Eternal Envy, starting with a defensive item in the Lincoln Sphere, won't be able to do so much damage. And as we said, Ember Spirit, going for more of a control-oriented build, so could definitely work out very well for Fofobos to get uh, a BKB as his next choice here. And want to point out, too, Phonic has recovered very nicely. He's currently 8.5. He has, but he's still, he's still behind the Doombringer. Obviously, you're always going to be behind the Doombringer when he goes 4 points to Valor. But the fact that Doombringer is already bringing the mech to the fight and Phonic is not, this is a big problem. Because it means C9's team fight at this point is superior. It's superior to Na'Vi. Of course, Dyer's Na'Vi do bring in your Enchantress attack. army, which does help them out. But having that burst heal as well as armor, you need, you really do. Well, I suppose you have Elm Titan, so hey, yeah, some of it's also removed. But I'm still feeling like C9 have the have the advantage when it's come when it comes to the team fights. And there's one thing we haven't touched upon so much now that you mentioned the Enchantress. Puppy generally plays really aggressive early game Enchantresses, and in some games he plays more farm oriented. But I don't think this is Dyer's one of the games in which you should just flat out for that hold, man. Massa Mors are coming in and Sing Sing. He's looking for the kill on Cora. Now Moonlight Shadow's going to protect it for the moment. And Sing Sing just jumping back on the spirits with the Massa Mors down. They leave out the boss. The vision was too early from Pine. Oh, just do They do him up, but he doesn't have mana for a Chrono anyway. He's actually soaking this up because he is the Aegis the Immortal. How much physical damage can they do? How he goes down. Then he can. Turn back over this one of Boss. He wants to die so he can have the mana so he can chrono, but he can't do it. They're buffing up the mass serpent wards in the meantime, and now finally, a boss goes down. It was the intention, it just came way too late. And then Eternal Envy wasn't even there for Cloud9. So they trade one one support for the Aegis, which I think is a great trade for Cloud9, in addition to getting half the tier 2 tower mid, forcing Navi to go for a rotation tier. And they, they didn't really accomplish too much out of that Navi. Yes, they didn't use the chrono, but. I would still say good play all around from Cloud9. Oh, he's soloing Koro in the middle lane. He made a replica just in case anyone else was going to come to him, but he knew he could wave four men, had more than enough damage to kill Koro after having those two points up and adaptive strike. Dyer's top tower is under attack. Envy's definitely getting very big, and you see now Cloud9, they realize what position Navi are in, oh, and they will be going for the tower here. Watch the top lane, man. He's going to jump in. He can't do it alone. He can't do it alone. You're right. He's got a harpy. You're right. <laughs> He needs much more. Oh, oh. Oh, he got the creep wave. Is he gonna leave sometime? The tower goes down and there's your jumping. He can catch Plant Eye and Sing Sing, but then he can fish up. As he holds it there with the totems of Dendi. He's burning up. Oh no! He locked in next to Sing Sing. He doesn't want to be here. The heartbeat. It's gonna turn over. Where's their extra damage? Slide of fist. Dendi's still alive. The star fall. And the impetus. One last jump in from Void. Able to pick off Sing Sing. The support from C9 just backed themselves up. Dyer's Plant Eye has nothing more to give. I can imagine Dendi was getting really scared there. You're stuck in, <laughs> in the chronosphere with a, 
Oh, oh, oh. Shaman, oh. that was not going to end well for you. He starts battling up against Korra, but while Korra's got Laguna Blade, Shadow Shaman is food to the lean up. He still did manage to get the tower though, and the top tower has fallen as well, so Cloud9 are getting way more map control than Na'Vi now. Na'Vi's still looking to take their first tower. We're 19 minutes into the game and they're playing an Enchantress, and you were talking about the Enchantress army. I feel like this is the point when the Enchantress army starts becoming irrelevant. It's we're, we're close to the 20 minute mark, the creeps don't scale, so... Yeah. Cloud9's <laughs> items are, are gonna make Enchantress a lot less relevant at this point. This is one of those times where it's like Enchantress turns into an aura hero, as well as a pure damaging hero, and you gotta try and get a little bit more space for the Impetus during the fights. Unfortunately for the Enchantress, is she's nowhere near the amount of farm required to even get close towards her Aghanim Scepter, so the buff up isn't there which means he really is just becoming a bit more of a scouter and maybe can find some good centaur stops. But get, holding on to your own creep wave, uh, holding on to your own army, is really difficult when you've already lost your tier one tower in the top lane. So you need to be able to safely get back out into your jungle. But you see C9's movement here. They've Radiant left a nice observer ward, which is watching attack. any movement inside the dire side jungle. And then anywhere else they can get nice deep observer wards, they want to watch the Na'vi rotation. There's actually, that's the only ward inside the Diocide jungle. They left sentries across the top lane instead. And Na'vi are nervous about this top lane. They really don't know what's going on. Dendi tried to scout with the arrow, and they're still not feeling confident going up there, so they'll try to go on the aggressive instead in the enemy jungle with Hovost in the front lines Which here. That's really smart. This kill for Na'vi needs to work out. It needs to not just be a kill, but it needs to transition into a tier one push. And if, it, if they catch out the right targets, I think they can get away with it. But at the same time, don't underestimate the ability to reinforce from Cloud9. They do have the Ember Spirit with the TP ready. Morphling has the TP as well. And they have two heroes in a very defensive position in the bottom lane right now. Moonlight, Shadow, and Smoke being used. So even if the Smoke's gonna break, they need to run down. Pylai Dai is just sitting on the tree line where it's safe. And Puppy, well, all he can do is just grab himself a new Santa, and they'll force out the bottom lane. What and they, saw, they just saw Havos breaking the uh, Moonlight Shadow in the bottom lane, so they know exactly what's going on. Yeah. He got pinged out, they know that Na'Vi is in their own jungle. Now the question is, can Cloud9 make the play? They know yeah, exactly they what's coming. This is all about who gets the better jump. They're TPing inside the tree line as well, so Na'Vi no idea about this. Remember, this is nighttime. The, view, the field of vision is very, very restricted. And with Envy as well as the Doombringer showing himself and the Spirit as well, attack. Navi have got to make a choice. If they fight, they back up. But Puppy, he steals the replicate and tries to send it away at the moment. Unfortunately, he's got no tango. He can't cut through the tree line. But he's going to send the replicate as far out of position as he possibly can. If Eternal Envy is a baller, he's going to replicate into that right now and wait for him out. Dude, he is a baller. He's got a Lincoln Spear as well as an Eagle Song. You know he wants to try and fight. And now they're actually using his replicate to scout out a little bit, as well as the Spirit going through the tree line. Avor still has that level 2 chrono, just begging to be used. Yeah. Eternal Envy wants to be the one getting jumped on here, as they're he does waiting. have the morph ability, but... They're waiting. The BKB's flying out right now for Avor. So having that during this fight is going to be so much bigger for Navi. It's still very crucial that Radiant's he doesn't have the, the Aegis anymore attack. though. Because it means that Bone7 can make the uh, the counterplay here with the Blink into Doom on the on the Void, or just cast the Doom really quickly when he jumps in on Void. The cast point should be low enough top for the Chronos Fear not to go off. Oh, nice fissure over on Denny, but where's the follow-up? They're still not there. They are not risking anything here. The Sentry just... was behind the tower. They want to make sure that no one spots anything. The thing about this, though, is that Na'Vi are showing their hand completely. They know that... Cloud9 know that Na'Vi have five heroes down here, so they're just gonna split push with, uh, with Sing Sing. As long as nothing is happening, Cloud9 are getting more out of this. They're farming two lanes, and Na'Vi are farming one. They're getting more experience, more gold. And Na'Vi just can't seem to find the right engagement point here. They will need to find an opening soon, or else they're gonna have to back out, and that would basically mean that they've wasted a full minute on four of their heroes here, which they're definitely not gonna be satisfied with. No, they need kills. <laughs> this Harpy is trying to do some serious work. Hilarious thing is too with the mana fall over on this army is quite easy. Puppy, now he finally comes down. And chance on point seven. I think he's just trying to elicit a reaction out of Cloud9, but Cloud9 are not biting the bait here from Navi. This is such good patience from C9. They're using the trees. Pylai is definitely... He's just holding back at the moment. He doesn't have a blink dagger. The only thing he's looking to do is call off a fissure in case there's an overextension. But Scorch Earth is now off. The fissure will again connect on Dendi. And this has got to flag the fact that Na'Vi, this Observer Ward, is watching every single thing they are doing. Unfortunately for them, they don't have a Sentry Ward here. The only Sentry Ward they planted was back... Oh, that's the Radiant one behind the tower. They have no vision, no detection here beyond Spirit and whatever Poppy's able to pick up. 
Yeah, the Astral Spirit doing a lot of work here with uh, chasing away Waybone 7. And actually Cloud9 are going to concede the tower. A little Radiant's bit surprising for me. I thought they might have attack. wanted to take this fight, but... I think they were happy with it, man. They delayed the attack. engagement so far. The amount of money which Sing Sing was able to pick up on the top lane would more than make up for what, what they lost by waiting on the tower at the bottom lane. And with Eternal Envy now grabbing himself the Ethereal Blade 23 minutes in, he's going to start looking at single, just mm. solo kills. That Puppy, however, is, yeah, Puppy has managed to grab a lot of tank ability, Dyer's though. With a point booster as well as Overclock, he might actually survive it. Dendi is really lucky to survive on that top lane just then. Thing seen coming in with a high level Flame Guard. He had to get himself away with 200 life points. The advantage of having those drums and treads first. Still overall, I guess we uh, we should say that just the way the game is developed, I guess it, it currently plays a bit to Cloud9's advantage there. It's not about the graphs for me, but more about the distribution of farm, where they have four out of the, or three out of the four top farmers on their team. They have, and the three heroes they have are actually cores that scale very well into the late game. Navi have good farm on the Void, but the others are, are falling behind quite a bit. But at the very least for Navi, their supports, which is something we very often see from them. They make sure to farm their supports, and in some games, Kuro actually starts doing a lot of damage in the late game, even on a hero like Lina. And he's, he's maxed Fury Soul, so he can do some damage, but we'll see. I like the fact, too, like, it's just, okay, you're not getting that much farm, so what do you want to do? You just focus on your primary and, and your best abilities. So he goes straight to the Aghanim Scepter. Poppy's going to do exactly the same thing. They realize they need a timing for the amount of damage output they can pump. So what they do is they just get Kuro and Poppy up to a point when the supports become a major damage problem. So if Favorsus, the man's on the front line, is tanking it up and getting a couple of lucky backtracks, he's going to waste a lot of time at Cloud9 while the supports are the ones pounding into, into C9. And they use Funic to basically make sure they get themselves the kill. Now, Roshan's back up again, so Favorsus will get this one a crank. I highly, highly doubt, though, that Cloud9 is going to allow this to happen. They have to be able to have a bit of a search out, someone to scout this out. Unfortunately, what they got? They got Spirit or Replicant. That's the only two ways they find, find this out without putting themselves in jeopardy. And it was pinged out by Pilate Eye and the rotation is starting now. There's still no Blink Dagger on this yeah, Earthshaker, by the way. He's pretty poor, 25 minutes in, level yeah. 7. The smoke movement coming in from 7. He's looking to make his way in. There's Sentry Wars, he gets revealed, he takes out the Sada. And the Blast comes in, the arrow connects on post 7. They chrono him. Eternal Envy is joining the fight though. Dandy, wave forms up. Maybe it's enough for Envy. Bone 7, he does go down. But Dandy as well, over next to the ancient area. Sing Sing looking in a force. The Doom is on, he can't get back inside the pit. The Fissure is blocking him out. So quickly, Envy with a double damage. Now the Echo Slam over on top of Koro. We're going to play dead. He never at least brings down one to nothing. The Fissure is there as a triple kill for Eternal Envy. The buyback came from a force. What, are they wanting to stop the Roshan from being done? Matt Serpent wants it there from Aoi. The Spirit's not making it any easier for them. But there is no way they can jump in there and get out with their life points to contest Roshan. C9 is the greatest fight they could have ever taken here in this match. So not Dyer's only do Navi lose four heroes, they also attack. lose Roshan, and they waste a buyback. That probably couldn't have gone any worse, to be honest. And the, the problem was, the way the fight was initiated by Cloud9, the Navi managed to catch out the Doom, but they didn't burst him down fast enough. So he managed to get the Doom off on Havost, which was actually a really big deal. Even though the Chrono was already used, Havost wasn't able to, to continue fighting properly. And at the end of the day, if you Chrono one target, and it's a high value target Dyer's like Doom, he has to die before the chrono ends. And Navi just weren't Dyer's in position for it, or maybe they thought they could get away with it without committing all their cooldowns, but it ended up backfiring really hard there. Now Puppy, oh! It doesn't need much more than that, man. And because you have a replicate, you can just jump yourself in and out so easily. Dyer's You're not risking your own life points to come in and go for the shotgun hit. They do secure the deny, though, so I guess Puppy's presence there actually made quite a difference. But still Cloud9 getting another tower, more map control, with the Roshan going their way as well. They're, they're looking really good to take this game one. What Na'Vi have to look for at this point is, well, do they have any smokes actually? There is no smoke available on any of their heroes. How's the store looking? No. Two and a half minutes for the next smoke rotation Na'Vi can pull out. And the problem is the, the warding that Cloud9 has, they've got a good one around the mid lane on the upper ledge, and they've got one at the bottom rune as well. So Na'Vi moving out without a smoke towards the middle lane area is going to be really difficult. So they're going to have to look for the side lanes, but if they're not showing in the mid lane around that ward, it becomes pretty obvious to Cloud9 that something is happening, but they might still get away with it. Havost is going in here. Is there a follow-up? No, there's, there's not. This there's is nothing. Not even close. He brought all five players of C9 in the top lane, but Poppy doesn't want to be around for that. This is a tower for Cloud9 without Ooh, the Navi just flat out can't fight. Oh! Nicely done. Use the spirit to get in range and let's eternal let me finish the job. 
The slide of fist to the searing chain. After using his spirit to just get himself just a little bit further up. And this now means the C9 no. The Enchantress is down, the Chrono is down, the Tier 2 tower is lost. Radiance Navi, middle Navi tower have to basically look attack. for a trade-off. They can maybe bring down the Tier 1 tower in mid, and it looks like Koro is already trying to force this lane out as quickly as he possibly can. Under attack. If Navi can get a trade, I think they should be happy with that, all things considered here, but I don't know if Pop is going to let them both seven going in with Doom and Shivas. <laughs> he has just sobbed the boss in his track and amazed the arrow from Denny Pro 7 moving back with the Empire High Dive! The Blink Dagger in for the Stompies holding a boss in position! The swing, the Indun, the Oh! Who oh, oh. actually reached that! But he's getting defused up by Bone 7 because he swallowed the creep, and now he's in trouble slowing down. The Mirage Wars will take a fall, and Elder Titan, they're all dying on different lanes. Koro is still going to go down here in the mid lane. Jukes are now for the fifth. Pilot, I, he waits it out, but it was up on the top lane where Eternal Envy is wreaking havoc. He's looking down at Envy, he's still got the Aegis the Immortal, so he wants to go in deeper here. He'll be happy to die as long as he can kill off Puppy. He's going in so deep, he just goes into the enemy's base. Puppy is the only one alive for Na'Vi anyway, and he zones him out. The urn? Okay, will he let the tick happen? He doesn't have enough mana to turn around for a shotgun blast. And the Arcane Brutes are still on cooldown for now, but the rest of his team arrives and he'll let the Aegis go out. So he goes back to full life, and this means Puppy can't come anywhere near him. AUI 2000 needs five mana to use the Mass Open Wards right now. I imagine he'll drop them immediately and they'll start pressuring this tower. They there will indeed go up here, putting them in position so they're good at hitting the melee racks. So it looks like Cloud9 are going for the big barracks here. Searing Chains is out hit him, he needs a little bit more. I think he was trying to just be a little bit more efficient there and not use all of his abilities to kill off the Enchantress. But the stomp from Funic tries slow down the C9 push, but the Mass Open Wards, you said, perfectly positioned right in front of the melee racks. A couple is still in range of the range racks as well. The full top racks of Na'Vi is now lost. Kuro actually went for a deny on the barracks. Forced? That's a very aggressive TP out. Is he willing to go in on this one? He still sees Envy. The problem is you knew that was going to happen. He jumps out to the replica, so there was no point initiating in. Now Shadow Shaman actually didn't go for the Blink Dagger, but finished the Aghanim Scepter, and this means the next push from Cloud9 is going to be even more explosive and just bring down the, the tower and barracks really easily. Whatever hope Navi had on the back of us, it's it just seems like their their overall strategy and their laning, they, they lost too much in the laning stage. They really did. The Morphling had complete free farm. Uh, the Doom got a lot more than the than the Elder Titan. The mid lane went okay for Na'Vi, but that was kind of the only lane that they really won. And if you're picking an Enchantress as your second pick in the draft, I believe it was was it the second pick? I think it was, right? No, it was the Marana, so it was the third pick. Yeah. yeah. So if you pick it as your third overall pick and you don't execute with it very very early on, this hero generally doesn't have that big of an impact in the mid game. Yes, you can get an Axe Scepter and start dealing a lot of damage, but if the enemy cores have been farming and you're getting mediocre farm on the Enchantress, it just... Um, it just hasn't... I, I haven't felt he, the Enchantress pick be worth spent, it at all this game. He spent most of his early game just trying to make sure Havorce won the middle lane. Like, we were there going, hey, Havorce, like, great CS up against Sing Sing. But Sing Sing was also battling up against, like, Harpies, Tornadoes, Satyrs, all these different these different creeps of Puppy. And look how much he executed there. anyway. Look how much Sing Sing managed to accomplish in the game, even though he got countered early on. He also got a lot of space up on that top lane. That big wait, the two minute to maybe even three minutes worth of waiting time around the Tier 1 tower in the bottom lane, Sing Sing had all the time in the world just to get free farm then too. But I can completely understand that Navi went for that play when they did because they they realized in the, in the game position and what was going on, if they just sit back and let the game continue the way it had for the first 15 minutes, they would just keep getting further and further behind. But they never got the opening to actually got, get in on the tower. Sure, they managed to get it in the end, but they committed so much time and so many resources to it that it wasn't really worth it. And I, I guess the story of this Dyer's game is just Cloud9 are winning simply on draining the map better. They've also executed better in the fights, I would say. This is why they have more kills, of course. But the main way they've won the game is just by putting smarter lanes, executing better in the early game, and just farming way better overall. And you just see Eternal Envy now on the net worth graph. He's almost twice that of the second hero, who is, by the way, also on his own team right now, the Ember Spirit. This is a very, very fond Morphling. It's gonna get even. It's gonna get even better for C9 fans in a moment. Like when you get a full butterfly up and you've still got another 1800 gold behind you, your agility is going through the roof, which means your combo is also going through the roof. The Enchantress cannot survive even with a full Aghanim Scepter. And the same for Lena. Lena's at managed to finish up the full Aghanim Scepter on a level 13 Lena, but you've only got 1300 life points. That's not enough to survive up against a Morphling. At this point for Navi, I think it's not about surviving, it's about getting the opening. They have to one-shot Morphling. They need to commit, kill him off immediately, which they definitely can. I mean, should they manage to catch Envy off guard with a Chrono, 
with Astral Spirit on top and the Earth Splutter and everything Koro has, they can probably one-shot him. Uh, they need something to remove the Lincolns for Koro, though, so it doesn't block the Laguna Blade, and they could probably do that with, like, an enchant or something from Puppy. Uh, and if, if they manage to do that, it's, it's a very easy kill for sure, and then that could snowball into a fight for them. But I have this feeling that if they don't catch the Morphling, if he's not the one they initiate on, it almost doesn't matter who else they catch. Look at Pilot Eye. He's looking at two heroes. He just owns them, and now he comes for seven as well. With the whole stuff of off, the Chrono will go over on Pilot Eye. The main chance helping to keep him alive, and the Koro getting e bladed down. The Morphling wave forms up. They lose the Urshik, but Slide of Fist with the Battle Fury leaves, helping him out. The Morph got war trapped outside. And this is this is just almost open for Na'Vi. The game does inside the right base. GG. So GG. 33 minutes and just under 50 seconds, 29, 21 to 9, Cloud 9, in my mind probably everyone else is here, that was a very convincing win. Great game one for them, they, they picked heroes they were comfortable with, they got the lanes they wanted, Na'Vi also got heroes they like and, uh, yeah. and were comfortable with. The, it was a little bit of a different draft from them from what we've seen at this tournament, we haven't seen much Elder Titan, we haven't seen Lena at all until this game, and I like the idea.